Hello BookTube! Welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Uh, today I'll be bringing to you my pile of possibilities for Historathon 2023, quarter three, covering the era from 1500 to 1820. Um, I've got uh, links below in the description box describing what Historathon 2023 is about, as well as a list of uh, my co-hosts. I am a, a co-host. Um, there's a, an active discussion I can barely keep up with, but it's just so fantastic to see everyone in constant conversation with each other about all the books that they're reading. Um, you can join it as well. You don't have to have a channel or be putting out videos. You can just join along in the Discord discussion. So, uh, yeah, so please join us. And we still have quarter three and quarter four to go. And hopefully we'll have a return of Historathon for 2024. Um, but how's it going? I tell you what, I think I'm going to do a wrap up at the end of the year <laughs> because my reading schedule is so hectic. Um, as you know, I, I also write book reviews. I'm constantly writing book reviews, uh, trying to meet deadlines, in addition to my day job. So uh, things are always quite busy here at the History Shelf, but I love it. Uh, I, you know, I want to be able to do more. Um, in some of these events, but I, I do the best that I can, so I hope that that's okay. <laughs> um, so with this stack of books, I, I selected some stuff off my shelves. I know that there are two, by the time I show you all the books, I'm going to tell you which two I know for certain that I will have finished, and I can give you guys a, a wrap-up of sorts. Um, but I have a stack here of, see, six six books. Seven. Seven books. So nothing too crazy as far as a pile of possibilities go. Let's start with one that uh, you may have already heard about from Bill Rutenberg's channel. Uh, my friend Bill. We're going to be reading this book together, so this is a definite yes. Um, we're going to work through this book for the next three months, and we might even do a like a Zoom buddy Buddy, like a book chat, like we've done in the past for our buddy reads, but uh, we'll see. More to come on that. So I will be reading H.W. Brands's Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. Uh, as you know, I've talked about H.W. Brands on this channel a lot. I've, I've already read, well, I've read several of his books, and I think uh, Bill and I did a book, one of his recent books, on the, the Zealot and the Emancipator about Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, and we had a, um, a book chat follow-up on that. Um, I will try to remember to link that below if you want to watch that video. Um, we both love H.W. Brands, and this is a topic that I am really excited about. So I'm excited to read this with Bill. Um, because when you think about it, uh, I'm trying to think of what triggered something recent in my memory where I read something, yes, it's coming to me now. Yes, I just finished reading, well, not finished, but not just finished. I did finish it, but it was a couple of months ago, um, and I reviewed it for shelf awareness, but there's a new book out right now called, um, now I'm blanking, but it was like about George Washington's family, his, his adopted um uh, stepchildren and um, and it kind of went into the family of, of uh, the Custises, right? Um, Martha Martha Custis Washington's children and their grandchildren and um, and it kind of goes into while George Washington was alive, you know, people were really split uh, along different lines of thought. Um, some some kind of wanted to keel back towards Great Britain. Others wanted to kind of cleave the way of um, you know, France, like with Jefferson. So there was a lot of political differences that kind of stemmed from that time. But uh, so when I saw this, I was like, this is a perfect selection for Historathon Quarter 3. It says here, what causes people to forsake their country and take up arms against it? What prompts their neighbors, hardly distinguishable in station or success, to defend that country against the rebels? That is the question H.W. Brand's answers in his powerful history of the American Revolution. George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were the unlikeliest of rebels. Washington in the 1770s stood at the apex of Virginia society. Franklin was more successful still, having risen from humble origins to world fame. John Adams might have seemed a more obvious candidate for rebellion, being of cantankerous temperament. Even so, he revered the law. 
Yet all three men became rebels against the British Empire that fostered their success. Others in the same circle of family and friends chose differently. William Franklin might have been expected to join his father Benjamin in rebellion, but remained loyal to the British. So did Thomas Hutchinson, a, a royal governor and friend of the Franklins, and Joseph Galloway, an early challenger to the crown. They soon heard themselves denounced as traitors for not having betrayed the country where they grew up. Native Americans and the enslaved were also forced to choose sides as civil war broke out around them. Just trying to keep an eye on Roxy. <laughs> After the Revolution, the Patriots were cast as heroes and founding fathers, while the Loyalists were relegated to bit parts best forgotten. Uh, our first Civil War reminds us that, um, that before America could win its revolution against Britain, the Patriots had to win a bitter Civil War against family, neighbors, and friends. And here's our author, Mr. H.W. Brands. So, very much looking forward to reading this. In quarter three. Wow, we just got a downpour of rain here. We've had some crazy weather here. Our 4th of July yesterday was completely um, storming, lightning, thunder, downpours of rain. Did not stop the fireworks. People were shooting stuff off in a downpour. Uh, it amazed me that you could still see all the, uh, the fireworks popping up, and they were going for two and a half hours. I swear, these people are hardcore out here in the country. <laughs> You know, it, and we're talking loud, booming fireworks, so crazy. Um, the next one I picked up as an option, as a pile, part of my pile of possibilities, kind of fits in with the time of the American Revolution, is A Crisis of Peace. Ooh, sorry for the reflection there. A Crisis of Peace, George Washington, the Newburgh Conspiracy, and the Fate of the American Revolution. Let me just turn that off. There we go. So you just see the light. Not my computer screen. And this is by David Head. Um, I actually uh, t um, had a brief exchange with him on Twitter. Wanted to possibly interview him as well. That still might be a possibility. Um, but anyway, Roxy is being a curmudgeon. She's going to make her sounds. Um, this is the dramatic story of George Washington's first crisis of the fledgling republic. In the war's waning days, the American Revolution neared collapse when Washington's senior officers were rumored to approach the edge of mutiny. After the British surrender at Yorktown, the American Revolution blazed on, and as peace was negotiated in Europe, gave grave problems surfaced at, surfaced at home. Can you guys hear the rain? I don't know if my camera is picking that up. We have just just been deluged with rain lately. Um, the government was broke and paid its debts with loans from France. Political rival rivalry among the states paralyzed Congress. The Army's officers encamped near Newburgh, New York, and restless without an enemy to fight, brooded over a civilian population indifferent to their sacrifices. The result was the Newburgh Conspiracy, a mysterious event in which Continental Army officers Disgruntled by a lack of pay and pensions may have collaborated with nationalist-minded politicians such as Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Robert Morris to pressure Congress and the states to approve new taxes and strengthen the central government. A Crisis of Peace tells the story of a pivotal episode of General Washington's leadership and reveals how the American Revolution really ended with fiscal turmoil, out-of-control conspiracy thinking, and suspicions between soldiers and civilians to so strong that peace almost failed to bring true independence. So that is Crisis of Peace by David Head. Uh, I'm going to have to let Roxy out of the room real quick, so hang on one second. This came out in 2019, and this is from Pegasus Books. Should have mentioned the H.W. Brand's book. It's by Doubleday. Okay, I'm going to let Roxy out real quick. Sorry about that. I don't have a pause button on this uh, camera, so we're just going to keep rolling. Um, the next book I, uh, is part of my pile of possibilities. This was an older book off my shelf. I bought this used um, because I'd heard about it from uh, something I saw on book, uh, Bookspan or C-SPAN, Book TV. But one of the people talking about it raved about it. So this is an old book, but this is 1587, A Year of No Significance. The Ming Dynasty in Decline by Ray Huang. Um, 
This is an older book, as you can see, like the Yale imprint is really, the logo is way old. One of those great old books, you know. Uh, this came out, this edition is from 1981. Um, if you open up the, the book, it, the pages start to crack. Like, I feel like I'm going to break the, it's an older used book, so i got to be gentle with it. Um, hang on, got to let Ro <laughs> Daisy out now. Out. Okay. They have been just fit to be tied with this weather. It's been hard getting them exercised and so they're kind of a handful right now. Um, it says here, because this is an older book so there's not a, a proper blurb on the back, but I remember from the book TV thing that the guy was like, this is a fantastic account. Um, and I think one of the reviews here says, uh, I want to get more into the, you know, Chinese history, um, going further back than just like, you know, recent history or the 20th century. So um, I thought this might be a good place to start. Uh, it says here, Huang shows a mastery of the intricate d details of the ritualistic and practical sides of Ming court politics and an ability to make them comprehensible. His story is cleverly constructed and deliberately paradoxical. If 1587 is, in the long run, a year of no significance, it is nevertheless full of incident. And each incident carries promise of future drama. So, yeah, just this is more of an arcane uh, book, kind of, you know, obscure. I just pulled this off the shelf and I thought, why not? You know, maybe it might intrigue one of you out there. Uh, let's see. I, this one is more of like a religious history, um, and I'm kind of so I kind of wanted to mix up the the different uh, genres here for quarter three, um, and I'm pretty sure this fits in. Well, okay, it kind of does. The subtitle would indicate not, but it's about someone who lived. I believe he lived in the 18th century, so that would fit in. Um, this is about John Edwards. Uh, this is from InterVarsity Press. This is a brand new book out right now called An Infinite Fountain of Light. Jonathan Edwards for the 21st Century by George Marston. So a brand new book out by, from uh, InterVarsity Press, one of my favorite uh, Christian publishers. Uh, just wonderful academic titles, the, the, theology, apologetics, commentaries, hermeneutics, things like that. Um, but this is a nice, thin little volume. I, you know, I could probably squeeze this one in along with the other two that I'm, I'm committed to. But it says, Christians need to pause once in a while to get their bearings for perspective on our own times and how we got here. It helps to listen to wise guides from other eras. In an infinite fountain of light, the renowned American historian George Marsden illuminates the landscape with wisdom from one such mentor, Jonathan Edwards. Drawing on his deep expertise in Edwards and American culture, Marsden explains where Edwards stood within his historical context and sets forth key points of his complex thought. By also considering Benjamin Franklin and George Whitefield, two of Edwards' most influential contemporaries, Marsden unpacks the competing cultural and religious impulses that have shaped our times. In contrast, Edwards offered us an exhilarating view of the centrality of God's beauty and love. Christians' love for God, he taught, can be the guiding love of our lives, opening us, up, opening us to transformative joy and orienting all our lesser loves. With Marsden's guidance, readers will discover how Edwards' insights can renew our own vision of the divine, of creation, and of ourselves. Um, it's a beautiful book, and they, they did this whole gold um, and papers here. Look at this. I mean, it's just... It's, it's a really, like, it's, it's kind of a gl it, glittering almost. It's beautiful. Um, just thought it might fit with the, uh, the readings and um, kind of, like I said, kind of change it up a little bit and have a little bit of, a, uh, of a religious or faith reading as part of Historathon 2023. Um... Yeah, next book is another old one I pulled off the shelf. I bought a used a while ago, and I noticed that I had started reading it. I've got a bookmark in it. 
I never, I didn't finish it, and I, I didn't get too far into it, so I'm putting the bookmark back at the beginning. I took it out and putting it back at the beginning because um, I want to start it again. Um, this book, and I bought it from Thrift Books Used. It's a very, uh, it's a decent paperback copy. Just checking my battery levels when you see my eyes move. I'm trying to make sure I've got enough juice to make this video. This came out in 1982. And this is a Grove Press edition of Alexander of Russia, Napoleon's Conqueror by Henry Troyat. As you can see, just kind of an older, older copy. It's part of the Grove Great Lives series. Um, just love my Russian history, as you know. Um, so it says here, in Paris and London, the crowds hailed him as the man who had conquered Napoleon, the liberator of Europe, and the benevolent, enlightened mar monarch. Um, at home he came to be feared as a reactionary, oppressive autocrat, in a country where millions of serfs were still treated as little more than personal property. A grandson of Catherine the Great, a conspirator in the assassination of his own father, and an idealistic and ineffective participant at the Congress of Vienna, Alexander was torn all his life between his liberal illusions and the hard realities of autocratic Russia. In a brilliant biography of one of the most unorthodox of Russia's czars, Henry Troyat delivers a masterful portrait of Europe during a momentous period in its modern history. So that kind of sounds good, doesn't it? I think so. Um, weighs in about, about 300 pages. But, um, yeah, there's our, there's our guy, a little close up there. There you go, now it focuses. So, another um, possibility for Q3. Um, another one that is a possibility I got recently, and I, um, I believe I've already shown it on... No, I haven't. This was going to be part of my new History on the Horizon, which I need to film this week. I've got a bunch of new titles here. Uh, new or upcoming titles. So they are either hot off the press or about to be. Um, but this is part of it. So you're going to see it twice, because I'm going to include it in the new History on the Horizon. But this is from Oxford University Press. Um, pretty sure... Yep, came out this year. Another t a topic that fascinates me. This is Conquistadors and Aztecs. Let me pull that back so you can see the whole thing. A History of the Fall of Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan. If anyone knows how to pronounce it, let me know. Tenochtitlan. Anyway, <laughs> Conquistadors and Aztecs. And this is by Stefan Rink. It's not too thick of a book, as you can see. Um, yes, it says here, 500 years ago, a flotilla landed on the coast of Yucatan under the command of the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés, while the official goal of the expedition was to explore and to expand the Christian faith, everyone involved knew that it was primarily about gold and the hunt for slaves that a few hundred Spaniards destroyed the Aztec Empire, a highly developed culture is an old chestnut. And Martin says that a lot. That old chestnut. <laughs> so funny. That's right. Uh, so it's an old chestnut because the conquistadors, who had every means to make a profit, did not succeed alone. They encountered groups such as the Lax Caltex, uh, who suffered from the Aztec rule and were ready to enter into alliances with the foreigners to overthrow their old enemy. In addition, the conquerors benefited from the diseases brought from Europe, which killed hundreds of thousands of locals. Drawing on both Spanish and indigenous accounts, or sources, this account of the conquest of Mexico from 1519 to 1521 not only offers a dramatic narrative of these events, including the fall of Tenochtitlan and the flight of the conquerors, but also represents the individual protagonists on both sides, their backgrounds, their diplomacy, and their struggles. It vividly portrays the tens of thousands of local warriors who faced off against each other during the fighting as they attempted to free themselves 
from tribute payments to the Aztecs. Written by a leading historian of Latin America, Conquistadores and Aztecs offers a timely portrayal of the fall of Tenochtitlan and the founding of an empire that would last for centuries. Um, and here's our author, Stefan Rink. Um, book is about 300 pages. Um, so a brand new history on the Aztecs and the Conquistadors and, uh, you know, the, I don't think it's a controversial topic to mention that, you know, the, um, that old chestnut is false. Uh, I mean, even the America, the U.S. Army out in the West when it was, uh, you know, conquering the West, uh, they used Indian allies, you know, as guides, translators, um, from different tribes that were at war with the particular tribe the U.S. was at war with. Um, there's, it, it was ever thus. It, it, it is that way throughout history. Um, that alliances are, are never monolithic. They're always fluid, especially with, um, with tribal identity. So, Conquistadors and Aztecs, A History of the Fall of Tenochtitlan. I'm going to stick with that pronunciation now. That's the only way I can say it. <laughs> so, there's another possibility. All right, the final book in my pile of possibilities, which is now a certainty because I'm actually reviewing this uh, for the Washington Independent Review of Books. Uh, and I think my review is due later this month or early August. <laughs> I better check on that delivery date. This is a very intriguing book. It's quite different. And I think it fits within the time frame. It might go a little over 1820, but it kind of starts... The beginning starts earlier. I'm going to go with this. It's kind of on the it's kind of borderline, but it's pretty close to the era. So, I'm going to I'm going to include it. Plus, it's a brand new book. This is my advanced reading copy. So, um this is actually publishing on July 13th from Cambridge University Press, but I will be reviewing it. Um and this is called Brooding Over Bloody Revenge: Enslaved Women's Lethal Resistance by Nikki M. Taylor. Cambridge University Press. It'll be out next week. I bet you my reviews do at the end of this month. Uh, it's a slim volume, um, so it shouldn't take, but it's very academic. There's lots of notes. Uh, it's about 180 pages um, to read, but I can, you know, get back to you guys as part of my wrap up at the year year end to show you what I was able to do during Historathon all year. Um, but, where is my description of it? I don't have a pup sheet for this. Okay, let's just go with this. Uh, from the colonial through the antebellum era, enslaved women in the USA used lethal force as the ultimate form of resistance. By amplifying their voices and experiences, bloating over bloody revenge, strongly challenges assumptions that enslaved women only participated in covert, nonviolent forms of resistance, when in fact they consistently seized justice for themselves and organized toward revolt. Nikki M. Taylor expertly reveals how women killed for deeply personal instances of injustice committed by their owners. There's the stories presented, which span centuries and legal contexts, demonstrate that these acts of lethal force were carefully premeditated. Enslaved women planned how and when their enslavers would die, what weapons and accomplices were necessary, and how to evade capture in the aftermath. Original and compelling, brooding over bloody revenge opens a window into the lives and philosophies of enslaved women who had their own ideas about justice and how to achieve it. Um, and let's see, our author is the professor and chair in the Department of History at Howard University. Um, and this is her fourth book. So, fascinating, right? I don't think I've ever read anything quite like that. Or I've heard it and I've been anything quite like that. So, I'm intrigued. And I will be following up on this with a written review for Washington Independent Review of Books. So, that is my pile of possibilities. If I'm able to squeeze in another, it would be from this set right here. Okay, these are my possibilities in addition to the two that I know for sure will need to be completed, which is H.W. Brand's Our First Civil War and Nikki M. Taylor's Brooding Over Bloody Revenge. 
So these are the two that are for sure. Uh, let me know what you think is intriguing uh, and cool about this other stack and what you would, what you might pick if you, if you had uh, time for a third. Um, let's see, we're at 25 minutes. So um, the rain has settled a little bit, so that's fantastic. I am going to um, try to get this uploaded. It will probably take a while. So this probably won't be posted until late this evening. <laughs> eight or nine o'clock it just takes forever to upload um, so the shorter I keep this the faster it'll go up let me know in the comments below again what you think of these selections any random thoughts always happy to hear from you guys please join us in the discord discussion um, I think we have instructions on how to do that so let me see if I can put that in there um, anyway guys it was great to talk with you again I look forward to hearing from you thanks for tuning in thanks for subscribing and watching the history shelf. And as always, I am your host, Peg. Until next time. Ciao.